is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil McCordick, and the name of the show is Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're taking a closer look at chemistry. Ooh. Chemistry is the science of atoms and molecules, the things that make up all matter, and how they interact with each other. Take, for example, this glow stick. Actually, don't take it, because I, I, I kind of need it. The glow stick doesn't glow until you... Um... The glow stick doesn't glow until you break the barrier and mix the two chemicals, and they start to glow. Huh? Pretty cool, huh? Chemistry! Now, the chemical reaction we're looking at today is the old vinegar and baking soda volcano. But this reaction doesn't have anything to do with volcanoes. It's chemistry. Now, this experiment is totally safe, but I do recommend you get an adult's permission before you do it, because it's very messy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> First, you're gonna want baking soda, and vinegar, these are your two main ingredients. But you'll also want dish soap and red food coloring if you want it to look a little bit more like lava. Now, I like to mix the baking soda, red food coloring, and dish soap together with a little warm water, so all you have to do is add the vinegar. And when you do, this is what happens. And there you go, chemical reaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how much vinegar or baking soda do I use? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. This is where you can be science maximites. Try different amounts. More vinegar, more baking soda, more dish soap. Who knows? Write down the amounts each time you use it and find out what amounts work best. That's called science. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Chemistry in all its forms. And of course, because it is Science Max Experiments at Large, we're going to max out the vinegar and baking soda volcano. So I'm off to the Center for Skills Development and Training. Come on. Hey, Talina. Hi, Phil. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. This is Talina. She's going for her PhD in chemistry from McMaster, right? Yep. Awesome, which means you can help me max out the baking soda and vinegar. We need vinegar. Can you grab that vinegar? And vinegar volcano. So what happens when we mix these two chemicals? Well, vinegar is an acid and baking soda is a base, and when you mix them, they neutralize each other to produce carbon dioxide and water as a byproduct. Hmm, so acids and bases are kind of like opposites. Yep. So I guess that makes sense. When you put them together, crazy stuff happens. Yeah. Awesome, chemistry. Okay, so I want to use this much vinegar and this much baking soda. What's with the fish tank? The fish tank is where I want to mix it all together. What do you think? Awesome. Maxed out. Okay, uh, let's move the fish tank somewhere where we won't make a huge mess. It's a little heavy with all that. We get it. Uh, no, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to take a couple trips. That's kind of heavy. Okay, so we'll take this and that, and then this and, then, and that. No, hold on. I can do it. One, one more. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I took too much. I took too much. Uh oh. Uh oh. That's good, Ramona. Put it in the. Put it in the background. Put the sign in the background. Yeah, in the BG. I love the BG. Chemicals, 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 chemicals. What are chemicals? Are they things you have in a lab in a jar that say chemical on them? Well, yes, but if that's all you think chemicals are, then you need to know your chemicals. Turns out the stuff in the jar is a chemical, but the jar itself also made of chemicals. The table I'm putting it on. Made of chemicals. My lunch, chemicals. Roller skate, chemicals. My jacket, chemicals. This guitar, chemicals. My shoe, chemicals. This watch, chemicals. This fish, chemicals. Chemicals, 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 chemicals. Me, chemicals. You, chemicals. Ramona, chemicals. No, I said you're chemicals. Chem, never mind. 
This is it. The periodic table of the elements. All matter in the universe is made up of these pure elements. They go together in different ways to make up everything. All matter. Think of it like building blocks. These little atoms are some of the elements on this periodic table. You got one oxygen, two hydrogen, bam, you got a water molecule. One carbon, two oxygen, A, it's carbon dioxide. Two carbon, two oxygen, four hydrogen, skadoosh, vinegar. One sodium, one chlorine, hey, that's salt. All matter in the universe is just the stuff on here combining into these. And now, you know your chemicals. Mmm, sugar. Let's take a closer look at what's going on when we mix vinegar and baking soda. All chemicals are made of atoms. There's only four types in our reaction. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and sodium. When they go together like this, this is a molecule of vinegar, or acetic acid. And this is a molecule of baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate. When chemicals react, they switch atoms. That one goes there, this one goes over here, and then this one turns into this, and then what you end up with are new molecules. This one is called sodium acetate, and this one is carbon dioxide gas, the gas you breathe out. And do you recognize this one? Right, water, H2O. Why all this happens gets complicated, but the study of chemistry is all about how molecules are built and react with other molecules. All right, Talina, you ready? Yep. You're gonna pour all your baking soda in the fish tank, and I'm gonna pour the vinegar into this bucket, because you don't wanna, don't wanna pour them together right away. Okay, you ready? Yep. Okay, go for it. When you're doing your PhD in chemistry, do you get to do stuff like this? Yeah. Really? I got to do a lot of fun reactions in the lab. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> have you ever done this much vinegar and baking soda in one time? I can't say I ever have. There you go, that's what I like to hear. I already put the soap in the bucket so it would mix with the vinegar when I poured it in. Are you done your baking soda already? I am. I'll pour faster. <laughs> oh, faster. It smells vinegary. It smells vinegar. It makes me want french fries. <laughs> okay, Talina, you take this very full bucket of vinegar and dish soap. Thank you. I will take this one. Uh oh, we still have our third bucket. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll do these both at the same time. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Whoa! 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's awesome. So the one thing it didn't do, it didn't shoot up in the air though. Yeah, it's because the top is quite open. So you would need to constrict it to get it to shoot up. Oh yeah, because we're using just sort of a square, mm -hmm. a rectangular prism container. We should get something that's maybe something more like our vinegar bottle, right? Because yeah. there's lots of space down here, but then it forces it into a tighter opening at the top there. Um, like a volcano. Yeah. And what else can we do uh, to make it even more powerful, max it out? Vinegar is only 5% acid, the rest is water, so you could try using 100%. So what kind of acid is vinegar? It's acetic acid. So vinegar is actually only 5% acetic acid yep. and 95% water. So you can get 100% acetic acid? Yeah. Can you get 100% acetic acid? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Why don't we get a container that's sort of shaped like a funnel, like mm -hmm. a volcano, yeah. and 100% acetic acid, and we'll do it again. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Our vinegar and baking soda reaction went pretty well. But now we're gonna try it with a much stronger type of the same kind of acid you find in vinegar. Carefully putting this down. And watch out for the baking soda. You never know when it'll get out. And well, I guess that's just baking soda, huh? Yeah, that's pretty safe. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so this is baking soda vinegar volcano version two. We have this differently shaped glass. What do you call this again? That's an Erlenmeyer flask. Why is it called that? It's actually named after a scientist. Did he look like that? Was he sort of shaped like this? No. No? Was he just a good chemist? Good scientist, and I think he designed the glass. Oh, see, there you go. So if you want to have a glass named after you, be a good chemist and design a <laughs> glass. I want to make a fill beaker. So this is 100% acetic acid. Yep. And what's the difference between this and vinegar? Vinegar has 5% of this and 95% water. But this is 100%, so it's much stronger. Much stronger. Can you put this on your french fries? 
No, I wouldn't be putting it on your french fries. No? Nope. As chemicals go, how dangerous is this? It's not too dangerous, but you definitely don't want to be breathing it in, and you don't want to be eating it. Or getting it on your skin. That's why I'm wearing these fancy pants of gloves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour the acetic acid in this. What's this called? That is a graduated cylinder. Because it finished school. <laughs> so it graduated. Now you're going to mix water and food coloring and soap all together yep. and pour it into there? It'll help dissolve some of the baking soda, so hopefully it'll react better with the acid. Sounds good. Face protection. Oh. All right, that's good. And now, when we do it, I want to add the funnel at the end to like accentuate the concentration of but I don't know if it's gonna go so fast that I won't be able to get it in there, but we'll try it. Try it. Vinegar baking soda volcano version two. <laughs> Good thing you got the mask. It smells a lot like vinegar. It's really strong. Oh. <laughs> That was pretty good, but what, what can we do to make it even bigger? Well, you could try using a different chemical reaction. Ooh, okay, like what? The decomposition of hydrogen peroxide produces oxygen gas, and so that one's pretty vigorous if you use a catalyst. So we want something that makes a lot of gas so that it makes a lot of bubbles when you put the soap in it. Yep. Great, let's do it. And the sooner we leave that smell, the better, I think, for my, for my taste. Today, we're combining two different chemicals to create a reaction. Sometimes chemicals can combine in a way that makes them very different from how they started out. For example, this is sodium, or Na, on the periodic table. Now, the sodium tablets are in mineral oil because sodium reacts very strongly with water, even the water in the air, or especially the water in my skin. Watch what happens when I drop a sodium tablet into this beaker of water. Very cool and very dangerous. And this is chlorine, or Cl, on the periodic table. Chlorine gas is very poisonous. So, <coughs> so what happens if we combine these two deadly substances? Do we create some sort of super poison? Something more deadly than anything else known to science that causes fear and chaos in chemistry labs all over the land? No, we create Salt. Good old normal table salt. These two substances combine to make NaCl. Salt. Something completely and totally safe. Chemistry. Oh. 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 We've gone from vinegar and baking soda to 100% acetic acid in baking soda, and now we're doing the... Vinegar and baking soda volcano version three. No longer vinegar and baking soda. No. Nope. What are we using this time? So here we have some hydrogen peroxide. Oh, that's the stuff you use at home to put on a cut, right? Yeah, but the stuff at home is only 3%. This one's 30. So much, much stronger, much 10 times stronger. Yes. And is this more dangerous? It's definitely corrosive, so... Wear your gloves. Corrosive means it could eat your skin. It can burn your skin a little Which bit. is why we are wearing gloves and blast shield. What's going to mix with this? So here we have some potassium iodide, which is a salt, mm -hmm. and it's mixed in with some water. The most important part of this reaction is the fact that it creates gas. Oxygen Which gas? makes bubbles when you put in dish soap, right? Yep. So one big squirt of dish soap like that. Mix it up. Now we go over to the blast zone. That's plenty. All right. <laughs> now that's a reaction. It looks like there's steam coming off here. Why is that happening? Well, it is an exothermic reaction, so heat is being generated as the reaction proceeds. Oh, cool. Can we lift our visors now? Yep. Awesome. And what's being released? What's the gas that's coming off here? So it's oxygen gas that's being produced. Oxygen. Ah. <sighs> what we want to do is make this even bigger, but first, can we do it again? Sure. Because I have an idea. Hold on. <laughs> I think we should repurpose our old volcano. What do you think? 
Sounds like a good idea. Okay, so if we put it over here. All right, volcano version 3.5. <laughs> hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. Right, here we go. Whoa! Looks like lava. Whoa! <laughs> Look at that. That, now that is a big volcano eruption. Just covered the town. That is completely, the, yes. That town is gonna be very clean because it's all soap bubbles. It's the cleanest volcano this side of Science Maxville. So I still think we can do this bigger though, no. right? I agree. Um, oh, I know. What if we use some sort of uh, a tube, like, like, like maybe one of these, right? And then we attach it to um, like an air compressor. I think you'd get some height. Yeah, and we go aside. The atom in 60 seconds. The atom is the smallest unit in a chemical element. Atoms are made of three parts. Part number one are these guys, protons. They have a positive charge. The number of protons determines the element. One is hydrogen, two is helium, three is lithium, and so on. The protons sit in the middle here, which is called the nucleus. They sit in here with part number two, these guys. They're neutrons and they have a neutral charge. Now I've got eight protons and eight neutrons in this nucleus, making this an atom of oxygen. Orbiting around the nucleus are these tiny guys. They're electrons and they have a negative charge. I will demonstrate using kittens. Kittens are perfect because just like electrons, kittens are really small. And just like electrons, kittens move around randomly. You never know where they're going to be, but an oxygen atom should have eight kittens or uh, electrons somewhere inside. These kittens are constantly escaping, but guess what? That happens with electrons too. There you go, the atom, a nucleus of protons and neutrons surrounded by randomly moving electrons. Cutest science ever. How do you guys feel? Did you learn something? Huh? Pause up, who learned something? Hmm? Talina and I have made a bunch of chemical reactions, but in our quest to max things out, we've got a new plan. Whoa. Hydrogen peroxide and potassium iodide create gas. One way to max out the reaction is to contain the gas in something like a tube. We're gonna put the hydrogen peroxide in the tube first. Then we're gonna put in the potassium iodide in the top through a one-way valve. Then we're gonna pressurize the container. When it finally reacts, it will shoot up through the valve and we'll see how high we can get our stream of bubbles to go. But be warned, capping anything and not letting it escape is never a good idea. So we've got a release valve to make sure things work out. This is one of those experiments that's definitely on the list of don't try this at home. Vinegar baking soda volcano version four. Hydrogen peroxide, potassium iodide. And what we're gonna do this time is we're gonna put it in this tube. Hydrogen peroxide goes in here. And we've got, Talina, do you have the potassium iodide and syringes? Yeah, two syringes full. Two syringes full. About there is good. And then soap. Good amount of soap in there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna close this off and tighten it up. And then we're gonna pressurize the whole system. And then we're gonna add the potassium iodide and it's going to be spectacular, we hope. Okay, that's on tight. This is all good, putting this down here. And potassium iodide goes in here. Ready? Puts down, ready? One, two, three, go. And we back away slowly. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's check it out. Woo! 
All right, there you go. Vinegar and baking soda volcano max dough. Thank you, Kalina. Awesome. That was great. If you guys want any instructions for the stuff that we've done today, they're all on the website. And thank you very much for watching Science Max Experiments at Large. We kind of need to clean up a lot, don't we? Yeah. We have out here, we have the other room. So tell you what, uh, you get a mop, I will get the hose and a wheelbarrow for the sud. Greetings, Science Maximites. Today we're using fizzy drinks in our experiments. And a fizzy drink is just water with bubbles of carbon dioxide gas dissolved in it. So I thought since we exhale carbon dioxide, I could make a fizzy drink by just blowing bubbles in this water. Doesn't seem to be working though, does it? I don't see any bubbles, do you? No. Hmm. Water does absorb carbon dioxide gas, but I don't have a fizzy drink. Weird. Time to check the book of science. Oh, in order to make bubbles, you have to have pressure. So... This is an air compressor. It takes air and compresses it, puts it under pressure. So... Hmm. The container needs to be pressurized. Okay. When you get a container of a fizzy drink, the carbon dioxide gas is put in there under pressure, and it stays in there under pressure until you release it. That's the sound of the pressure being released. And when it is released, the carbon dioxide gas starts to expand. And when it expands, it creates bubbles. And that's what makes your fizzy drink. This process takes a while to run out, but eventually it will become flat. No more bubbles. But what if there was a way to release all of that carbonation all in one go? Well, there is. And for this experiment, all you need is your favorite brand of fizzy drink. Science Max brand, Diet Science Cola. 100% science, zero calories. And your favorite candy, like these science experiments. All the minty flavor that comes from pure science. So, all you need to do is open this up. Open this up. Take one of these and put it in here with an adult's permission because it can get kind of messy. Whoa! What's going on here is all of the carbonation that was in the bottle is now being released much more rapidly than it would have been before. Now, why does this happen? Well, if you look at a carbonated beverage, you'll see that the bubbles don't come from everywhere. They come from the inside of the glass, or in this case, a lot are coming from the straw. And that's because the carbon dioxide bubbles like to find a little imperfection, something to hold on to in order to expand and bubble out. And a candy such as this has a ton of little tiny microscopic imperfections. So when you drop it in, there's a lot more places for the bubbles to attach, and that makes the carbonation happen a lot quicker. But remember, this is not a chemical reaction. It all has to do with carbonation. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Air pressure, more pressure, less pressure, and of course, we're gonna be maxing out this experiment. All right, I just need an expert to help me max this out. Let's see, um, oh, Cynthia from the Ontario Science Center. She'd be perfect for this. All right, good. Okay, come on, let's go. And, yep, that's good. Hey, Cynthia! Hey, Phil, Cynthia, going? from the Ontario Science Center, you're gonna help me max out the science experiments and diet science cola experiment. Yeah. I, I think we need a better name for this. Okay, well, we have the mints that have tiny little pores called nucleation sites on them. The gas inside the cola is gonna go through these nucleation sites, create a giant fountain. Uh huh. So why don't we call it a nucleation fountain? Ooh, nucleation fountain, I like that. It's it's accurate and it sounds awesome. There we go. Okay, so uh, we wanna max it out. So how many should we put in? Let's say five. More nucleation sites. More reaction. Ah. I tried adding more mints, but one at a time didn't work. It doesn't. No. It's not. It, the bubbles are pushing it back out again. <laughs> there we go, there we go. <laughs> and then, yeah, I think if we put them all in at the same time, it would work better. So we came up with a delivery mechanism to get all the mints in at the same time. A tube with a magnet holding the mints up, which we screw onto the top of the bottle. 
pull the outside maggot to release, and... Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good fountain. That is a, a good, good nucleation fountain. Nucleation fountain worked very well. There we go. Cynthia and I decided to try some other ideas to max it out even more. We decided to do some... Experimentation. Experimentation. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yep. And see if Diet Cola was the best carbonated drink to use. We tried four different kinds. Diet Cola, regular cola, lemon lime soda, and club soda. So really just... It's just carbonated water. Carbonated water. Three, two, one, go. Whoa. Oh! Science Cola. But I think that uh, it was close. I think it was the release. Let's watch the replay. Okay. Yep, Diet Science Cola went the highest. So the next step is maybe if we want to max the size of the fountain, we have to make a narrower stream. Ooh, so um, a smaller aperture opening will be higher pressure. That's what I'm thinking. Because it'll be forced at a smaller opening. What else can we do? We can launch it. We could launch, oh, you mean like, Sideways. Yeah. Yeah, I love that idea. So we'll put it on wheels. We'll put it on wheels. Okay. And then we'll launch it sideways. Okay. These are, we have a lot of things to do. Okay, let's get. We, we need just, time. Let's do it. Get to it. Okay, okay, we'll go to the lab. I'll get a mop. <sighs> Nothing like a fizzy glass of water. And now there are ways for you to carbonate water at home with something like this, the Science Max Carbonation Station. You have a bottle of compressed carbon dioxide gas that's hooked up. You take a bottle of tap water, attach it, and carbonate it. Voila, carbonated water. But this is Science Max. Why just carbonate water? Let's carbonate everything. Let's carbonate pickle juice. <laughs> it's actually amazing. <laughs> milk. It's like milk meets water. Kind of very odd. Chocolate milk? Oh, no, that's way better. <laughs> Carbonated mustard. <laughs> Carbonated tomato juice? Carbonated hot sauce. No, wait, carbonated... That was the hot sauce. <laughs> no. <laughs> carbonated clam chowder. Oh, there you go. Carbonation, not just for water anymore. It is definitely not for clam chowder. No, that's just a big bowl of no. Never again. Cynthia and I are maxing out a nucleation fountain. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. that's a good fountain. We're changing our design a bit to see if a smaller hole in the bottle cap will make for a higher pressure fountain, which will make it more maxed out. We have uh, this large hole. Uh, we've got a medium-sized hole. We have a very small hole. So we're gonna see large, medium, or small, which one is the best. To max out our fountain. Exactly. But the problem is that our old delivery mechanism won't work if we keep the cap on. So we needed to come up with a new delivery system. So we drilled holes in the mints and put them underneath the cap on a pipe cleaner. They hang at the top of the bottle until we pull the pipe cleaner and then they fall in. All right, are you ready? Oh, I'm so excited. Which one do you predict will be the best? This will have a larger geyser. I this think this will, will look cooler yeah. because it'll be big, but this one? The smallest hole I think will go the highest. Yeah, ready? Three, Three two, two. One. Oh. Definitely the biggest. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. There. Whoa, careful. Careful. Whoa. This one is almost like a spray. It's not like a mist. Yeah, it's a, a mist, mist of cola. <laughs> they all kind of work a little differently. The interesting thing is this this one. <laughs> this one lasts the longest. Oh, 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 oh. There we go. So. This was, this was cool, but not the best. This one's still going. It's still it's going. It's not over yet. You gotta give it points for still going. <laughs> I think this fountain looked the best, though. This one was pretty good. So uh, a small aperture, but maybe not the smallest aperture yep. would be the yep. best. Um, so because of the force coming out of here, I think that we could probably do something like putting it on wheels 
and shooting, shooting it. it like a rocket? Yeah, let's, let's on see. On wheels? Uh, or like a car. Oh. Yeah, we'll make a, a nucleation fountain car. The Nucleation One! It's our race car. It's our race car. It's got fancy wheels that spin really well. And we decided to go with the medium aperture. So it's fairly big, but not too small. Yeah, all we need to do is unscrew that, put that in there, and then pull it out. Three, Three two, two, one. Oh, good, good, good. Let it go. Whoa. Oh, that's not so bad. Whoa, <laughs> yeah! Oh, missed the finish it's, line. It's past the thing. <laughs> turn it around, turn it around. Oh. Whoa. Do you think we can make it get to the finish line? It, there, it's oh, it, no. spinning out. Oh, wow. Uh, go, go. The, <laughs> it worked pretty well, but there's always more ways to max it out. What if we just got like a, a giant container? Hmm. Like, because we're using small containers, right? What if we just so got a really large container? want to carbonate container? a very large container. Well, we'd have to figure out some way to, well, come on, let's go figure it okay, out. Okay, let's do it. is an egg. It's been hard boiled and peeled, so there's no shell on it. This is a flask, and this is hot water. I pour the hot water into the flask, which means the air inside the flask starts to heat up. And when it heats up, it expands, and some escapes through the top of the bottle. I pour the water out, and then I cap the flask with the egg. Now this expanded air is starting to cool again, which means it's lower pressure, which means the higher pressure on the outside of the flask pushes the egg in. Ha <laughs> ha, fun! And then, to get the egg out, you... hmm. Ah, I can reverse it. If I blow into the flask, I can increase the pressure inside. <laughs> Science! And now let's max it out. Max out container! Okay, pour out the water. Oh, careful, careful. And now I put this water balloon on the top and we'll just see what happens. The hot expanded air inside the container is cooling and reducing in pressure, which means the higher pressure outside the container, it's happening, pushes the balloon in. It's happening! Oh. <laughs> Maxed out! Hmm. They don't know that we live on the bottom of an ocean of air. It's called the atmosphere. And compared to the Earth, it's really thin. I mean, it's about as thin as this. Huh? Huh, look at that, not very thick at all. But it's a good thing the atmosphere is around and not just for breathing. Though I am a fan of breathing. What do we want? Breathing! When do we want it? All the time. But did you know the atmosphere has different layers? It's true. I will walk you through them. No, I mean, come on, you gotta you got come with me. I'm walking over to walk you through them. Okay, the troposphere. This is the layer where we are all existing right now, where all of our weather happens. There's a lot of air molecules in this layer. Think, think of these balloons as air molecules. There's a lot of air in this layer. <laughs> Yay, air! Next layer, the stratosphere. There's less air molecules in this layer, and it's where jets fly. Next layer, the mesosphere. There's even fewer air molecules in here, and it's where meteors burn up and turn into shooting stars. Fire, 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 fire! Whoa. The thermosphere. Not many air molecules left up here, and this is where the northern lights, the auroras, happen. Woo! Northern lights! And finally, the exosphere. This is as high as the atmosphere goes. This is where satellites orbit, and if you see any air molecules up here, they're just passing through. Hello. And after that, nothing but the vacuum of space. Ooh, the vacuum of space. Of course, you know it's not that kind of vacuum, right? Right, vacuum just means no air. There you 
you go. The atmosphere. The only thing separating us from the vacuum of space. <laughs> Roberta, the space vacuum got broken. I don't know how. <laughs> Cynthia and I are maxing out the nucleation fountain. Whoa. This one is almost like a spray. It's not like a mist. Yeah, it's a, a mist, mist of cola. Just to experiment, we tried using a giant bottle and pouring the diet cola in. I'm a little concerned about the science, but it didn't work. Well, that's not very exciting. Okay, so that didn't work at all. No. This is not a chemical reaction. It's a physical change. So it's the carbonation that matters. Exactly. When we poured the cola into the bottle, we lost almost all the carbonation. How are we gonna max it out? That's the question. So if we can't make a larger container... More bottles? We just have more bottles. So exactly. we'll just get a lot of them and we'll set them off in a sequence or something. Okay, let's do a pattern or something. We'll uh, max out the I know fountain. What we should, you know, we should be sort of like a cascade and we'll get a, ooh, a lazy Susan or... or this is a vacuum chamber. It's an airtight container, and I put a hose on it, and the hose is attached to a pump. Now, the pump takes the air out of the chamber, creating a vacuum. So, let's have some fun putting things in a vacuum chamber. Marshmallows in a vacuum chamber. The marshmallows grow larger. Whoa! then shrink much smaller when returned to normal pressure. <laughs> Why? Well, take a look at what happens with this balloon. The vacuum takes the air and the pressure out of the container, which was pushing against the sides of the balloon. Without that outside pressure, the air molecules inside the balloon can expand. So let's max it out with maxed out marshmallow. Just like the balloon, the marshmallows expand. But unlike the balloon, the air in the marshmallows escapes. So they shrink when the pressure is added back in. They're almost the size of regular marshmallows. It's the air inside a marshmallow that makes it fluffy. It's not very fluffy. The same expanding process happens with marshmallow cookies. <laughs> The marshmallow has completely deflated and it's all kind of hollow inside. The frosting on a cake? More cake! No, no! Mmm, oh. look at this giant birthday cake. I can't wait to eat it. No! No! Why birthday cake? And even shaving cream. <laughs> Shaving slime! Cynthia and I have done a whole bunch of different experiments. Experiments. To find out how to max out the nucleation fountain. So we'll just get a lot of them and we'll set them off in a sequence or something. Okay, let's do a pattern or something. Now we have a bunch of bottles and we're ready to try the maxed out version. We've got our, our release mechanism with our medium aperture. Yep, and uh, we're gonna put the mints in all of the bottles and then we're gonna release them in a very coordinated... Pattern. Re rehearsed pattern. Very rehearsed. We've rehearsed it a couple times. We'll see how it goes. And we've got this lazy Susan, which will spin around and we'll see how it goes. And three. Two, one. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. seven. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Surprise. One, two, oh, go, 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 three, four. <laughs> we did it! No! <laughs> Whoa! It's raining giant science cola. <laughs> we maxed it out! Maxed out! Nucleation fountain, that is as good as it's gonna get. So let's recap. Our nucleation fountain is all about releasing the carbonation in our diet cola faster than normal. 
This happens because there's lots of tiny bumps on the mints for the carbon dioxide to grab onto and make bubbles. <laughs> High fives. Woo! There you go. Science Max Experiments at Large Nucleation Fountain. Excellent job. Now all we need to do is, is clean it clean up. Clean up, and I think I need a shower with water. Yeah, I think I need at least the towel. Yeah, okay, but it's let's... supposed to volumize your hair. Is it good for I your hair? So. I yeah, hope so. Than honey. Greetings, Science Maximites. <laughs> I'm Phil McCordick. <laughs> I think I overdid it with the fog machine. Uh, this is Science Max Experiments at Large. Can you even see me? Let's, let's go over here. Today we're talking about states of matter. Now there are three main states of matter. Solid, like this table. Liquid, like the water in this beaker. And gas. Yes, thank you. And we're also gonna be looking at the things that kinda go in between. Things that are sometimes solid, sometimes liquid. Like cornstarch mud, which is very easy to make. All you need is water and cornstarch, which you can get at the grocery store. Mix it up however much you want, just remember, two parts cornstarch to one part water. Twice as much of this, then you have of that. Very easy, mix it up and you get cornstarch mud, which sort of seems like a liquid unless you hit it. And then it becomes solid. But if I pour it, it's a liquid. Even if I hold it in my hand and I hit it really fast, it turns into a ball and it will stay in a ball as long as I keep hitting it or squeezing it, but as soon as I stop, it turns into a liquid again. Now, we're gonna max this out. We'll go through the portal and learn more about solids, liquids, and gases. Yeah, right. That's why I'm going to the Center for Skills Development and Training at, oh no wait, that's the code for the fog machine. Wait, uh, stop. Stop, it seems to be stuck. Oh, uh, never mind, never mind. Uh, I'll fix it later. <laughs> uh, right. Hey, Judy, how are you? Hi, Phil, how are you? Good. Judy is going for her PhD in chemistry, right? Yes. Fantastic, because that means you can explain cornstarch mud to me. Now, is this a solid or is it a liquid? Well, it kind of has properties of both. It's called a non-Newtonian fluid, uh -huh. so that makes it a liquid. A liquid, well, I mean, it pours like a liquid, but when you hit it, it's a solid. So why does it turn solid when you hit it? So when you're pouring it, the particles are still far apart, uh -huh. so they can't interact with each other, and so they stay a liquid. But when you're hitting it, you're jamming the particles together, and they line up to become a solid. Now, does it still work the same way if we have a lot more of it? Uh, it should. Great, because I've got this 20 kilogram bag of cornstarch and I have 34 more of them. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, but I think you'll need a much bigger container. N much bigger container, great. Um, I got some wood over there. I want you to go and I'll follow you. All right. I'll follow you. I got, I'm coming, I'm coming. Yeah, thanks, Ramona. And give me one of them fizzy drinks. Not too fizzy, just sort of medium fizzy. Thanks a lot. Hello, do you have trouble knowing what is a solid, liquid, or gas? Are you confused by jello? I mean, which is it? Is it a solid or is it a liquid? Water is a liquid, but what about when it's ice? Well, you gotta know your states of matter. There are three main states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. And there are three rules that you need to figure out which one of them is which. Does it flow? Does it fit the shape of its container? And can you squeeze it? Rule number one, does it flow? Solid, liquid, gas. Here's a gas, does it flow? Do the particles pour over each other and cascade down? Yeah, yeah they do. Does a liquid flow? Yeah, yeah it does. Does a solid? Nope. Rule number two, what happens when you put it in a container? Does it take the shape of the container? Gases take the shape of the container. Liquids take the shape of the container. Solids do not take the shape of their container. No! No! 
know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I get the whole pouring and taking the shape of the container, but come on, liquids and gases, they do both of those things. Well, it all comes down to rule number three. Can you squeeze it? Now, solids, you, you, can't, you can't really squeeze them. Liquids, you can't really squeeze them. Gases, ha-ha, bam, you can squeeze them. You see, gases compress. Liquids and solids, they don't really compress very well. The other difference between gases and liquids is gases will take the shape and the volume of the container they're put in. Liquids don't do that. So there you go. Solid, liquid, gas. And the rules. Does it flow? Does it take the shape of the container? And can you squeeze it? Now you know your states of matter. That'll be 650. Cash only. So what is cornstarch mud and how does it work? Well, cornstarch mud is a non-Newtonian fluid, which means it behaves differently than you or Newton would expect. Here's cornstarch and here's water. Cornstarch is made up of large, blocky molecules like this. Water is made up of much smaller, rounder molecules like this. When you put them together, it looks something like this. It all has to do with how the molecules slide past each other. When you put light pressure or slow pressure on the mud, the water molecules and cornstarch molecules have time to shift out of the way. But when you put a sudden pressure on it, the water molecules squirt out of the way but the cornstarch molecules don't have enough time. So you get a section that's nearly all cornstarch, which acts as a solid. Cornstarch mud is a shear thickening fluid. Shear is talking about the force of things sliding around, in this case, the molecules. So when the shear force is strong, the fluid thickens. Shear thickening. So here's the plan. If Judy and I make enough cornstarch mud could we run across it? Let's find out. Yeah, I think mine is just the right consistency. How's yours, Judy? I think I'm ready too. This is much harder than I thought. Yeah, it's really hard to get it mixed at the very beginning, but uh, yeah. mine is ready to go. Okay, here we go, Sounds first good. batch. You ready? Yep. Dump it in. Woo! Woo! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm, I thought that would be more. I thought so too. It's really not filling this up very much, is it? No. Huh, that's a lot of cornstarch. This is, um, this is great, but I think we're gonna have to go a little faster than this. I think we need some sort of mixing device. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to do this by hand. We can get some sort of machine to help us. Yeah. Right on, high five. Oh. <coughs> uh, we shouldn't high five when we have this stuff on our hands. Nope. Yeah, good call. This science is delicious. This is rock candy. It's basically crystallized sugar, and you make it by turning a solid into a liquid and then back to a solid again. Here's how you can make it at home. You need a container that you're not gonna need for a while and some water, some sugar. You can use brown or white. I like to use brown. And an adult. Here's why you need an adult. You wanna dissolve three cups of sugar into every cup of water. And you can't do that unless you heat the water. So get an adult, a saucepan, and heat the water up, pour the sugar in, and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. Then pour it in your container and let it cool down. Then you'll need a shish kebab skewer, which is something you can get at the grocery store. Cut it down to the right size so it fits nicely into your container. And then dunk it in your sugar and get some crystals coated around the stick. These are seed crystals, and they get the whole process started. And now you have to wait for these to dry, otherwise they'll just fall off the stick when you put it in the water. So I've got one here that has dried out. You'll also want something to keep it from falling in the top of the container, so I'm gonna use a clothespin. Put it in there and dunk it in the container like that. And now for the final step, if you want, you can add food coloring. I like to use red because it reminds me of science. And I'm gonna use the stick to actually stir that up a little bit. There we go. Now, the dissolved sugar crystals in the water will slowly grow on the crystals that are already attached to the stick, and it will eventually grow into a rock candy pop. But it takes about a week. No, I'm just kidding, I've already got one that's standing by. Here we go. This one 
has been growing for about seven days. And there you go, raw candy. Delicious science. Now, how could we make this any better? I mean, it's crystallized sugar. It doesn't get any more maxed out than that, does it? Yeah, it does, come on. This is a giant container of sugar water, and I've been brewing a massive rock candy uh, crystal in it for a while, but uh, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of getting a little bit too big to fit out the top of the container, so. Uh, um, you know what, I'm just gonna put that back in there and chalk that one up to science because, well, eating a rock candy crystal that big would definitely not be good for my teeth, so, yeah. So our big experiment is to take a whole lot of cornstarch and fill a trough to see if we can run on it. But mixing it by hand was going to take forever. So Judy and I got a drill with a mixing attachment on the end. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> All right, so Judy, I'm noticing a bit of a problem here. What is it? Well, if I mix at the top, everything's fine. But as soon as I get it a little bit deeper, and then it gets really tough, and the whole bucket starts to spin, and the drill stops. Yeah, I think it's because the drill's trying to mix it too fast. When we're mixing it by hand, it's slow, and you can still let it stay a liquid, but now you're just making a solid. Right, because it's a sheer thickening fluid, exactly. so if you hit it really quickly with something, like the blades of this spinning really quickly in the thing, it'll suddenly turn into a solid, and it'll be really hard to mix. Yep. So we go slow. Going slow. Going slow. Suddenly realizing that if we go slow, we'll be here forever. Yep. You know what I think we need? Whoa, sorry. You know what I think we need? We need a different way to mix this. Yep. We need a way to mix more of it, and we need a way that it doesn't hit it with blades that suddenly go through it really quickly. Something that can mix on a large scale, but slowly. I have just the thing. Come with me. All right. The interesting thing about bubbles is they're a gas surrounded by a liquid. So get some dish soap and some water, and then be science maximites and find things around the house that you can make bubbles out of. Just about anything that has holes will do. Or, mm -hmm. or I like this one, I call it the loud bubble. Ontario Science Center, and this is Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Good, so you are amazing at bubbles. Uh, I am, I've been practicing for a while. Let's get started. Okay. We're gonna make an okie dokie sign like this. Uh -huh. We're gonna dip it right into our bubble solution. Make, come on, get right in okay, there, right, right in, in there. Make sure you get it all, okay, that's, that's a little too much. Well, that's then good. I can make two. And then you're gonna keep that okie dokie sign, you're gonna blow very gently. Nice. I brought these two giant sticks here, and I don't know if you noticed, but I've got a smoke machine here. Right. So we'll turn that on, and then if you press that green button there, you're gonna shoot some smoke, and we're gonna try to catch that smoke in a giant bubble. You ready? Okay, and I'm gonna try to... Oh, that was so that was close. Great. Did you see wow. that one? You give it a shot. Nice! Oh, check yeah. that out! That was amazing! <laughs> that was huge. Try it again. Let's see if I can get the smoke so, machine. Here we go. Go for it, go for it. Push right towards. Oh, check that out, you did it, look at that, look at that! No! Smoke, and it, yeah. bounces, it bounces on the floor because the floor, it doesn't have any oils like our hands do. Isn't that amazing? That was oh great. my god, that was so cool. That was great. You know what I think we should do? What's that? Giant bubble, tons of smoke. Done. Okay, here we go. Let's do it, you ready? Giant bubble, tons of smoke, go. Awesome! Oh my god, look at that! <laughs> Look at that, that's crazy! Max out bubble. Well, there you go. Giant smoke-filled bubbles. Awesome! Yeah! Judy and I tried mixing the cornstarch mud using a drill with a mixer attachment. 
but it didn't work. We should have known better. Here's the mixer in our cornstarch mud. Usually, a mixer works by going really fast and mixing everything together. But remember that cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid. So, when the blades of the mixer tried to go fast through the cornstarch mud, it did what it always does, turn solid. The faster and harder you try to move it, the more solid it will become. This means the only way to mix it would be if we made the drill go very, very slow which wouldn't speed things up at all. So with the drill another lost cause, Judy and I okay. need the biggest thing around that could mix stuff up. Come on back. Good. Little bit more. Perfect. Ha 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 A cement truck, a cement truck is the perfect thing to mix because all we have to do is get all the cornstarch up in here and it'll mix it and it doesn't move it too fast. It goes nice and slow. So hopefully a sheer thickening fluid will be fine. I'm gonna get Judy. She's driving the truck. Hey Judy, that's perfect. The only problem is we needed to get all of those bags of cornstarch into the hopper of the cement truck. I didn't think it'd be this messy. <sighs> We needed to call the entire Science Max build team to help us out. This is possibly the messiest thing I've ever done. Awesome! Woo. Hey Judy, you wanna you wanna lift up any bags? I'm okay, thanks. That's okay. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, so uh, I can do them. Cool. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> I got most of it, I got most of it. All right, I think we're done. I think that's enough bags. Let's start the mixing. So, what do you think, Judy? Do you think it's gonna work? I think so, because you're mixing at a very large volume, but at a very low speed. Yep. So throughout the process, it'll stay a liquid until we're ready to run across it. That sounds exactly like the kind of science I like to see. You know what I really like is that every time I move, more cornstarch comes off. It's like, it's like I'm a human fog machine. This is liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up most of the air we breathe, but if you get it really, really cold, it turns into a liquid. The fun thing is you can use it to make other things really, really cold too, like, <laughs> This banana! I have frozen this banana solid thanks to the liquid nitrogen, and normally a mushy banana would not be able to hammer in a nail, but, whoa, because it's frozen, I can hammer this nail into this block of wood. So that got me wondering, if I can turn a banana into a hammer using liquid nitrogen, could I turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer? Let's find out. Pumpkin sledgehammer. Take one. No, I, I think the answer is no, you cannot turn a pumpkin into a sledgehammer with liquid nitrogen. All you can do is make a really, really big mess. I'm gonna have to clean this up, aren't I? Now we have a cement truck to help us do the mixing for our cornstarch mud. After making a giant mess getting the cornstarch into the cement truck, it's time to see if it worked. Hey, Phil, how's it going? Yeah, it looks like it's mixing pretty well. I'm really glad we're not doing this by hand because it'd, it'd take a really long time. We've almost got it at the right consistency, but it's taken some time. But it's getting a little dark out, Judy. I don't know, do you, do you want to quit and go home? No. Of course not. That's not what we do in science. Oh, here we go. Yeah! Awesome! All right, let's see it. Let's see if it's... I like how it comes down in little steps. And look, it's still... It's working just like it should. I hit it, and it's solid, but you can see it's pouring like a liquid. Yeah, here comes a big wave. Wow. Here it comes. Whoa! <laughs> and it's totally filling up. Oh, yeah. Filling up really fast. 
I think we should stop pouring very soon. Yep, we may not have a big enough trough. Yep. Hey, liking it. It's good. Yep. I think it's time. It's not even done pouring, but I'm gonna try it. Okay, you ready? Whoa. <laughs> Oh, and you did it! Whoa! You can't. You have to get back onto the sides before you stop moving. Or else it becomes a liquid. All right, it's your turn. Okay. Here. Go. Okay, ready? Okay. You gotta, you gotta hit your feet really fast. All right. Here, go. Yeah! Oh, that actually works. Because cornstarch mud is a sheer thickening fluid, it means it stays a liquid until you hit it suddenly, like with your hands, or in this case, our feet. And then it turns to a solid. So as long as Judy and I keep slapping our feet down with enough force, we can walk on top of it. One more dance. All right. And let's tell do you what, it. we'll do one more dance. All right, let's do that. Okay, ready? All right. And, and go. go. All right. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> We've done it. Solid liquid gases, thanks very much for joining us on Science Max Experiments at Large. Woo! <sighs> Greetings, Science Maximites. <clears throat> Welcome to Science Max <clears throat> Experiments at Large. My name is Phil. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be looking at water. But <clears throat> water is very heavy. But that's okay, because we need it to be heavy for this experiment to work. I don't know if I need that much of it, though. Maybe I can get, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, that's probably all I need. Today, we're going to be building a water-powered car. You'll need a base for your car, like this styrofoam, water bottles, shish kebab skewers, straws, scissors, elastics, paper plates, tape, a square of paper towel, modeling clay, vinegar, baking soda, water, and glue or a hot glue gun if you have an adult to help you, and... Uh, yeah, I know, this one is pretty involved. That's why you should go to the website for step-by-step -step instructions. Take your paper plates and glue two together to make a wheel. Then make three more. Wrap elastics around your base and then tape straws on the bottom. Trim them down, maybe about that much. Then take your shish kebab skewers and push it through a water bottle cap to make a hole. Then stick one wheel on, put the skewer through the straw, and do the same thing on the other three sides. Then take the water bottle cap and get an adult to help you make a perfect hole in it so that it fits your straw. Then use some modeling clay and hot glue to seal the straw and the cap so it's airtight. Attach the water bottle to the base of your car, then fill it with some water and vinegar. Next, you'll want to wrap up a spoonful of baking soda in the square of paper towel so you can make a little package. Finally, stick something underneath the underside of the bottle to raise the end up off the base. Bring your cap and then go outside. Ah, here we are outside. Yeah, I know, we're not really outside, but I have a science lab and you probably don't, so I highly recommend you do this outside. And don't forget your safety glasses. Now, this is why we make a little packet of baking soda, because we want to delay this reaction as long as we can. So I like to hold it there. We'll hold it there with one finger so I can get the cap ready, because we don't want it to react until we can get the cap on and then kink the straw to keep the pressure inside till we're ready to let it go. Then at the last second, you want to drop that packet in and quickly cap it and kink the straw. And woohoo! <laughs> there you go, a water-powered car. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute, that's a vinegar and baking soda powered car. Well, kind of. The vinegar and baking soda create a gas, and that gas creates pressure in the bottle, and that pressure forces the water out of the bottle. But it's the water leaving the bottle that creates the thrust. The water going that way pushes the car that way. Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So what we're gonna do is max out the water-powered car. Figure out how to get water going that way so we can go that way. But we means me and someone else. Who can help me? Oh, I know, Anthony from the Ontario Science Center. He'd be great at this. Hopefully he's not busy. We're gonna max out the water-powered car. Ha.
Anthony. Phil, sorry about that. Did I scare you? Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, how you doing? Awesome, thanks. Great. I was wondering if I could get your help on an experiment. Yeah, okay. Which one? Uh, I'm building a water-powered car. It's going to be great. It's science and max headquarters. I'll, I'll show you. Phil? Anthony? Phil? I'm here. What? Phil, where are we? Oh, this is the parking lot for Science Max headquarters. Oh, so, okay. Today, yeah. I want to max out the water car. This thing is awesome. Yeah, so what you do is you use vinegar and baking soda, yeah. and you pressurize this container, and, okay. and the water shoots out that way. So the car goes this way. Ah, Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, you know okay. your stuff. This okay. is why you're here. This is because I could really use your help and advice on how to make this bigger. Okay, so we're gonna need a bigger tank to pressurize. Uh, so this, what about something like this? So we need something that can hold pressure. Do you think this would work? I don't know if we'd wanna. And we'd have to put like pressure fittings on the barrel, like like cut a hole yeah. and weld them on. I don't know if that's. Something tells me this wouldn't work. So okay, we need, sure. Um... I got some other stuff over there maybe that we could uh, use. Oh, ah, ah, check this out. Yeah, I think this would work. This would work a lot better. Well, this is my stand-up wash tub base. Your what? So yeah. we'll, we'll reuse it. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm thinking yeah. now, though? Uh, I yeah. know this. The problem is, I think this is like an oil drum, right? It and, is. And it's, a, it's an oil tank from a house. And these things are not built for pressure. You can get water tanks that you pressurize. Oh, uh, like hot water heaters. Yeah, you can uh, pressurize. They're built for that stuff. You pressurize them in your basement, and then the water travels up to, to like the top your floor. shower that or makes... something like that. So we'll, all we need to do is get a pressurized water tank. OK. Put water in it, put pressure in it, and put it on wheels. Uh, <laughs> and then we open sounds... the valve and it goes, right? That sounds amazing. All right, yeah, let's get to it, man. OK. okay we I got to... some water tanks over here in this corner of the parking lot. Seriously? Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. When you're a professional chef like me, you spend lots of time perfecting the perfect recipes. I know my way around a kitchen, and today I'd like to show you one... That's not the fridge. Oh. <laughs> today I'd like to show you one of my favorites. Quail truffle gazpacho cakes on a plate of ice. Beautiful. And here's how to make it. Take some quail, some truffle, and some gazpacho and put it into a cake. Delicious. And here's the interesting part. How to make the plate of ice. Ooh. How did I do it? Well, I tried many different methods, and none were very successful. <laughs> but now I let science do the work for me. So here's what I do. You see, I've got my large block of ice, and I've got a fishing line over the top, and on the bottom, I've got two heavy weights. Now we wait. The heavy weights put pressure on the fishing line. This pressure melts the ice where it's pressing down. As the ice melts, the fishing line moves through the block of ice and eventually cuts its way through. There we are. My hours of waiting have almost paid off. You see, I've got a perfect line through the ice, and I stopped it just before it finished. It's the pressure of the line on the ice that makes it work. The same thing happens when you use ice skates. You see, it's a very thin line, and your body weight presses down on the ice, melts it a bit, and that allows you to glide across the ice. It also allows me to just pop this off. There you are, you see? Perfect plate of ice to put my delicacy on. Let's just try that now. There we go. Um. So I've joined Anthony and we're going to max out our water-powered car. Our small design works by creating gas, which creates pressure, which forces the water out of the bottle, creating thrust. Our new plan is to get a water tank, put it on wheels, and put water in it. Then we use an air compressor to pressurize the air inside. When we open the valve, the water is forced out this way, which causes our water car to go that way. Okay. Ha-ha! <laughs> so, water car, maxed out version. Aha, uh -huh, huge. Water yep. tank. And filled with lots of water and lots of, uh, lots of air. air. Yeah. 
what I got, right? Whoa. It's a lot of it. So, did it mess up? Did it mess up my hair? Uh, no, you look fine. You look great. Okay, good. Now, the only thing left is we just gotta open uh, this valve here, right? Yeah. You wanna do the others? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it, okay. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, go! go! We open the valve and our pressurized tank moves forward. The air pressure in the tank forces the water out with enough force to move the tank. Awesome! That was awesome! That was a great run, yeah! That was amazing! So, pressurized water tank on wheels. Totally worked. Totally worked. Total success, yeah. Um, so, because this is Science Max, the only thing we can do now is make it bigger. Bigger, right? exactly, okay. yeah. So, uh, problem is, I don't think we're gonna find a tank bigger than this one. Yeah. Um, so, because then it would be too heavy, right? Exactly. Much way too bigger. Heavy. Maybe, maybe what we can do is just get a lot more water, okay. and then and then we find a way to pressurize the water. Oh, so don't pressurize the whole tank, just just the stream of water that's going out As of the tank. As it comes out, exactly. Something kind of like a like a fire hose. A fire hose, right? So, so we take a big container of water, right? And we, I guess we would need a pump. Yeah, like a pump would be perfect. So then we we suck the water out of the container, put it through the pump to pressurize it, shoot it out of a wa uh, fire hose. Uh huh. And then our car. Goes flying. Goes flying. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. All right. Amazing. When water is going fast, it has a lot of force. This is a power washer. It's made for cleaning concrete and wooden decks, but it doesn't use soap and it doesn't use heat. It only uses the power of water. Let's try it out. The power washer creates a stream of water that is moving really fast. It has the force to clean concrete, strip the paint, or even the Science Max logo off wood. But how do I max out the power washer? What's the most ultimate use I can think of? Power washer pumpkin carving. <laughs> The power of the pressure washer creates a stream of water strong enough to make short work of my pumpkin. Power washers may only shoot water, but they can be dangerous, so don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, science! The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic and you'll be granted entry. Send in the next candidate. Oh, no, not Overwhelmo. Did someone say Overwhelmo? No, wait, no, next. No, not that. Okay, okay, good, okay. Behold the design, Overwhelmo! Welcome back, Overwhelmo. If you can truly demonstrate magic, you may join the Wizard Academy. A glass of water! <laughs> no, no, wait, that is not a whole trick. Okay, hold on. Okay, and this, a waterproof playing card. I put the card on the glass and flip it upside down, and then I say the magic word. The magic word. And behold, magic! <laughs> Yes? Is that it? Yes? Well, it's not magic. It is defying gravity! No. Nope. The water would fall and the card would fall to the floor. It's not magic. This is magic! No, it's science. Horse feathers! Look, the reason the water doesn't come out is the air at the top of the glass keeps it held in by suction. More air would have to get into this glass to decrease the suction, and because the playing card is keeping a seal on the glass, the suction of the air is holding the weight of the water up. Boulder dash! Uh, all right, look, let's do a little experiment then, shall we? Let's move the playing card just a little bit from the edge of the glass. Whoop. 
You see those bubbles? Yes. That's bad news. <laughs> Science, not magic. Well, I will return, and then you will see your mind will be melted by by the. No, that's not my music. Hold, hold. Will you will rule the day when? That's not my new hold. Overwhelmo shall return. Our maxed out water car worked pretty well. Now it's time for something even more maxed out. We start with a giant tank on wheels. We add a pump to pressurize the water and a fire hose to shoot it out the back. What's more, this version is big enough for me and Anthony to ride. Water car! It's amazing! This is the more super improved water car. This tank holds 1,000 liters. And right now it has 720 liters of water. We have a pump. A pump, that's water right, pump. our water pump. So the idea is we take the water from this container out through your hose, really pressurized, going really fast that way. Our car goes really fast this way. All we gotta do is just turn on the pump and we're ready to go. So we fire up the pump and the water stream comes out really strong. So strong I can barely hold on to it. But even so, there's a problem. Yeah. Nothing happened. No, nothing really. Well, something happened. We got wet, but it didn't really. Okay. It's too heavy. It's too heavy. So you're on it, and I'm on it. That's a lot of weight. So we don't this. ride it. That's something. Yeah. And uh, also. This is kind of going crazy. Yeah. Because if nobody's holding it, it's just going to flap around. So we'll have a brace here. Yeah. Shoots it that way. That's good. And then we'll need, I feel like we'll need something to kind of propel it. Maybe a better propulsion system. Kind of like uh, one of those steamboats. So we put a big paddle wheel here. Exactly. And we aim it, I guess we aim it like down. down at the, yeah, exactly. Like that. And then. At the paddle wheel. And then the paddle wheel spins, and that propels the car. Exactly. Right? Right. Okay. okay, well, we can do that. Let's do it. Sounds good, Let's yeah. Put it together. You know what? I have a paddle wheel because I had a failed hydroelectric. This is called flyboarding. Whoa. Ah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Powerful jets of water are being shot out from this board at my feet. Whoa. The engine on the watercraft behind me creates the water pressure, which travels up the hose and through the jets. The force of the water is strong enough that I can use it to fly around. So what's the difference between this and a water car? Well, we don't have to take that much water with us because it starts in the lake and ends up in the lake. So the only water I have to carry is in the hose that goes up to the platform. <laughs> Flyboarding is lots of fun, but it takes some practice to get it right. Bouncing on jets of water isn't easy, but I got the hang of it. It's all due to Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Oh. Oh. Physics! Woohoo! Our maxed out water car didn't work so well. The main reason is that that much water is heavy. 720 kilograms. Yeah. So Anthony and I have a plan. Rather than rely on the force of the water going straight out the hose, we're gonna put a water wheel on the back of the water car. A water wheel works by catching water in the segments of the wheel. The weight of the water on one side of the wheel causes it to start turning. But we're gonna use the weight of the water and the pressure of the water. Hopefully, both combined will be enough force to turn the wheel, which will drive our water car forward. A little construction, and we have it ready to go. Okay, so here's the latest version of the water car. Water wheel! Yeah. All right. Yeah, there we go. We try it out, but there's a problem. The trick with the water car is the water itself weighs a lot. Every liter is one kilogram. So our 720 liters we start with is way too heavy to get the car moving in the beginning. 
But as the water gets pumped out, there's a sweet spot where the weight is low enough the water car might move. But then there's only a little water left, so it's a balancing act. We fill it again and see if we can come up with a plan. Okay, new and improved version, only half full. So the idea this time is because we're starting with it only half full, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Then it'll begin to go a little easier because it won't have as much weight as it had the last time we did it. And Phil, yeah? I can't even move this thing. What? I don't, I don't think, I think there's too much fuel. There's too much. Yeah, there's no way we can move this. There's no way this is gonna be able to move. Even awesome. half full. You even can't half full. Move it. I think we need less fuel than we're gonna get down to like maybe like a quarter or something like that. The thing is we ran it from the full tank last time and it and it never Okay. It so never moved at all. What if what if we gave it like a, a push to kind of help it get over that little like that little bump of energy? Ah, oh, so give it a, the, the the first push when it's a, still got a bunch of water in it, we give it a bit of a push and then maybe it'll go in its exactly, own. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Or yeah, you know? absolutely, let's okay. do it. We start the pump and wait for the amount of water to get to just the right spot. Then we give it a push while it's still kind of heavy to start it moving. Sure enough, that push makes all the difference. Yeah, okay. The water car is light enough to roll, has some momentum to keep it going, and the force of the water coming out the pump is enough to keep it moving forward on its own. Still going! Oh. <laughs> all right! Like a beauty. It worked out. It went all the way. That way. Yeah. Way to go. The water car finally a success. It was the push. It was the push. That's all we needed to get it going. A bit yeah. of a push to get it going and a lot less water. And uh -huh. there you go. It totally works. All right, you want to do it again? Absolutely. All right, yes. here we go. Okay. See you next time on Science Max Experiments at Large. So much so easier to push it without any water inside it. Greeting Science Maximites. My name is Phil. And I am opposite Phil. Opposite Phil. That's right. Blue lab coat, yellow shirt, evil mustache. I see. Anyway, we're looking at opposing forces today. That's uh, forces that make things go down and forces that make things go up. Right, things with more density and things with less density. Uh, gravity and the opposite, which is anti-gravity. Anti-gravity isn't really a thing. You're well, I have to do the opposite. Right. Um, buoyancy. And buoyancy's opposite, which is girlancy. No, girlancy is not the opposite of buoyancy. You know, you're not helping. Right. Not helping. Opposite. <laughs> Hello. Uh, goodbye. Hey. Today, we're going to be making a gravity-powered boat. Ta-da! It's pretty easy to make. You just put water in the top here. Gravity of the water pushes it out the straw and the boat goes forward. And it's super easy to make. You only need four things. A piece of styrofoam, a plastic cup, craft stick, and a straw. And the tools you'll need, a pen, a craft knife, and the help of an adult, and science glue. Which is the same as regular glue, except I only use this glue for science. You take your styrofoam and you cut it into a boat shape. That requires the knife and the help of the adult. Then take your cup and draw the circle that your cup will sit in. And then you wanna put two slashes with your craft knife in there. Again, get the help of an adult if you need it. Uh, and then start carving out the styrofoam with your finger and make a nice little indent just like this for your cup to fit in. See, and then it fits in nice, nice and snug. So then what you wanna do is you want to make a hole in the cup. You can use a pencil. The hole has to be just big enough for the straw to fit in. First, you want to take the straw and dig up in this direction so that it will be a nice angle for the water to come out and then you want to get the straw back up into the cup like that and then glue it so that it is not going to leak any water. And then in the final step, and this is your choice, you don't have to do this, but you can use your craft stick and you can make a rudder or if you want, you can make a whole keel which goes just like that and it is right in the middle of the boat and this helps the boat go straight because sometimes the straw goes off to the side one way or the other. Okay, water powered boat. Actually, it's a water and gravity powered boat. You see what you do is you fill up the cup with water 
and the gravity of the water in the cup pushes it out the straw and the boat goes forward. And this is what it looks like in the water. You fill up the cup and the gravity pushes the water out that way. The buoyancy of the boat keeps it afloat and good old Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The water going out the straw this way pushes the boat that way and it works pretty well. Whoa, if it's going straight. That's why we have the keel. Okay, so gravity powered boat. Time to max it out. But first I need an expert to help me. <laughs> and, oh, of course, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. Perfect. All right. And, uh, right, let's go. Okay, well, that's a good idea. Tell you what, I got my waterproof portal uh, ordering device. So I'll order some sort of uh, a bin. Yeah. Like a big yeah. plastic bin. Okay, hold on. hold on. Here it comes. Oh, there it is. Okay, so a big plastic bin. Yeah, and then, you know, you see this straw here? What if we had something like that? It's a bigger, like. Like, um, like a pipe of some sort? Yeah, like a big pipe. One pipe coming up. I need to get myself one of those. Yeah, but it doesn't always work, so. Oh, here it is. Wow. So, bin is the cup, yep. pipe is the straw. Yep. Uh, so now all we need is the boat. Yeah, the platform itself. I think we need something that's gonna be really stable because we're gonna have a lot of weight this time. How about like a surfboard or um, or one of those stand-up paddle boards? Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, check this out. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Water stopping. That doesn't look good. I think it might have gotten stuck. Oh. We'll have to go get it. Because the water is still running and that might overflow. Man, so. Buoyancy is the tendency for things to float. Things like this balloon or this ball in water. But it doesn't float on its own. But it doesn't float on its own. The helium is less dense than the air molecules around it. And they fall past the balloon and push it up. The ball is less dense than the water around it. So the water molecules flow around the ball and push it up. This happens because water is a fluid. The particles flow around each other. This works because air is a fluid. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, air isn't a fluid, but it is. Usually we think of fluid as meaning a liquid, but in this case, fluid means anything where the particles can flow around each other, and that includes air. But you know what? It's hard to see the particles in water. Same thing with air. I can say it, but it's really hard to see it. Now, um, yeah. Now this is sand, and it behaves like a fluid too. Well, sort of, check it out. Look, it's made of a whole bunch of very fine particles, and it takes the shape of its container. But watch this. I put a ball in the sand, and it doesn't float. Now the ball is less dense than the sand, but it doesn't float because the particles of sand have a little bit too much friction right now. But watch as we move them around and reduce the friction by adding some air. Now, the sand is behaving like a fluid, and the ball floats. Let's see what else floats on sand. How about this pumpkin? Yup, that floats. How about this block of wood? Yup, that floats too. How about this styrofoam ball? 
Yeah, that definitely floats. Look at that. The sand is a fluid right now because all of the little particles of sand are moving around. But watch this, if I turn off the air, everything freezes in place. Nothing floats anymore because the sand is no longer behaving like a fluid. So there you go, buoyancy. It all depends on the density of the thing and the fluid it's surrounded by. Huh? Science. Michaela and I are maxing out our gravity-powered boat. We had a bunch of maxed out materials. We just needed to get our surfboard. So we got our giant bin. We got a giant tube. Water's gonna come out of this end. And we've got a valve here, which means we can fill the bucket, and then we can turn on the valve and see what happens. Oh, whoa! Hey. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Now we're gonna turn on the valve, and that means now the water is flowing through. Ooh. Hey, it's working. It's not bad. Right on. Whoa, look at that. This thing is really working. Yeah, it's taking off now. So, okay, this is good. It's going about walking speed. Now that it's working, how do we max it out? Our fuel here is the water, so yep. what if we just had even more water? And it doesn't last long, does it? Yeah. Maxing out our boat even more is easy. A bigger bin for more water and a wider pipe to move more water for more thrust. Okay, so a bigger bin yeah, is a lot harder to fill because it's hard to get to the top of it. Well, you're working against gravity, so it's gonna work for us. I can really appreciate the amount of water that we're putting into this. That's that's four buckets full. Wow. This is five buckets. We open up the valve and it starts to go. Yeah. It's working. It is working. Look at all wow. the awesome <laughs> bubbles. Okay. It works really well. It really, yeah, it's wow. definitely faster than the other one. I think it's the larger pipe, and we need more water because it doesn't last very long. Check it out, it looks like it's going even faster now that we've lost a bit of the water. Less weight. Yeah. This is working great, so now how do we make it even better? Okay, well, the only force working with us right now is gravity, right? Of right. the water coming out. What if we add in an extra force? And we could squish the water down to go out faster. Okay, watery high five. <laughs> okay, we gotta get the, it's all way over here. Come on, we gotta get it. move the water from this container to this container. Now, I could just pour it, but what if it's too heavy? It's too heavy! Help me, science! Well, science to the rescue with this! A clear plastic tube! Ooh, sciency. Okay, watch this. I'm gonna make a siphon, and it's pretty complicated, so follow along. Are you ready? I stick one end in here, and one end in here! Whoa! Yeah, I know, it's not working yet, but that's because we haven't added the science. First, we need to add a little bit of suction and suck the water through the hose like a straw. It has to go over the highest point. Watch this. And there we go. Look, the water is going up. I can even make the water go up even more, and it still works. But why does the water go up? Water doesn't like to go up, right? Well, the reason why is because there's more water going down than there is going up. So that creates suction on this end, and the gravity of this water pulls that water up. So gravity is doing all the work for us. And that is a siphon. Huh? So now let's max it out. This is the same container of water, but now it's colored slightly blue, so you can see it go all the way up through this hose. The only really hard part about this is sucking the water all the way up to there. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I got it working. Now, the reason why it's working is because there's just a bit more water on this side of the tube than there is on this side of the tube. With a siphon, it doesn't matter how far you go up, as long as the water on one side is lower than the other. Science. about helium balloons, right? Helium is a harmless gas that is less dense than air, which is why helium floats. If I was to breathe some helium, my voice sounds higher because helium is less dense than normal air, so my vocal cords vibrate faster. Ah! Uh... 
But have you ever wondered, is there a gas that's more dense than air? There is. It's called sulfur hexafluoride, and it's much more dense than air. So if I was to breathe some, my vocal cords would vibrate slower, making my voice lower. Ha 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 ha! This container is full of sulfur hexafluoride. Ooh, I know, it's invisible. You can't see anything. But watch as I blow some bubbles. The bubbles are floating on top of that layer of sulfur hexafluoride. The bubbles float because they're full of regular air, which is less dense than the sulfur hexafluoride. In fact, a balloon will float on this as well. The balloon floats lower because the weight of the latex also drags it down a bit. But the bubbles and the balloons are floating on a sea of sulfur hexafluoride. And it is like a sea because it's a fluid just like water, but it's more dense than regular air. Science! <laughs> it's awesome. Michaela and I are maxing out our gravity-powered boat. It was already working well, but now our idea is to try squishing out the water so it gives the boat more thrust. We just had to come up with a brilliant idea how to do that. Garbage bag! Garbage bag! Yeah, garbage bag! Okay, maybe we should explain <laughs> oh, the garbage no. bag. It's okay, so the garbage bag is attached to the pipe at the back end. Well, there's a hole in the, in the garbage bag. Well, we fill the garbage bag with water. <laughs> then we tie the garbage bag tight. Tie the knot so the air doesn't get it. Now that we've got that, we use Bowling balls! And we put the bowling balls on top of the garbage bag, and this will, whoa, squish the water out. Really, it's pushing on that bag. Okay, ready? Okay, let's see. Hey, it's moving. It is Our moving. bowling balls were squishing the water out, but the boat didn't seem to be moving much faster. I think the bowling balls made the whole thing too heavy. What if we raise the bin up? If it's higher up, then there would be more force due to gravity. Yeah, so we have the bin on like stilts or something, oh and then it has to fall further, and then maybe the water's going faster. I love that idea. Okay, good. Yeah, let's try it. So what we need Sorry. to do is get Wait, this. No, no. Oh, I thought this was the shallow pool. No, yeah, no, that's no, that over one, there. That one. Yeah, yeah, not here. Max Historica. Long, long ago, in the time of ancient Greece, there lived a genius named Archimedes. One day he was in the tub and he noticed something. Oh, hello. Look at that. When I get into the tub, the water level goes up, and when I get out of the tub, the water level goes down. Ha <laughs> ha! Eureka! I, um, don't get it. Well, I can calculate how much volume something takes up by how much water it displaces. Yep, still not with you. Uh... Now, I'll give you an example. How much water would be displaced pushed aside if I put this ball in the water. It's light, so not much. Ah, it doesn't matter how heavy it is. It only matters how much space it takes up. Watch. Ha, ah, you see? The same volume, huh? I think I see. How much water will be displaced when I put this bowling ball in? Uh, more because it's heavier. Ah, nope. It doesn't matter how heavy it is. It only matters how much space it takes up. Watch. Oh. You see? A simple and easy way to measure something's volume. Archimedes, one of the greatest and cleanest scientists in history. Join us next time for more Max Historica. The metric system in 60 seconds. The metric system is a way of measuring things. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, a kilometer is 1,000 meters, but few people realize just how interconnected the metric system is. First of all, it breaks down to a base 10 system. Everything is 10, 100, or 1,000 of everything else, and it's all based on water. This is exactly one liter of water. It weighs exactly one kilogram. It fits into a cube 10 centimeters on each side. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius and freezes at zero. And this happy little fellow is one milliliter. It fits into a cube one centimeter on every side. It weighs exactly one gram. And the amount of energy required to raise this one degree Celsius is one calorie. The metric system, everything interconnected and all based on water. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh. Uh oh. Pop 
Michaela and I are experimenting on our maxed out gravity powered boat. Trying to squish the water out with bowling balls added too much weight for it to make much of a difference. So now we've raised our tote higher up, which means the water will have farther to fall and be going faster when it comes out. And I got a totally awesome name for our boat. Tell me, what's up? Totes McBoats. That's a totally awesome name. Totes McBoats. Yes. Okay, so are we ready to fire up Totes McBoats? All right, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn on the valve. Okay, ready? And let go. Totes McBoats. <laughs> What we hadn't considered is that much weight that high up would be uh, tippy. Uh, totes McBoats no longer afloats. We needed a way to solve the tipping problem first. You know what we need to do? What? We need to build an outrigger. All right, so check it out. This time we have an outrigger, which means our boat's gonna be a whole lot more stable. It's not gonna fall that way because this thing is floating. And it's not gonna fall this way because it has a lot of mass as well. I think we're almost ready, eh, Phil? Yeah. Okay, are you ready? Ready. Okay, let's do it. Turn on the valve. Go, Toast Me Boats. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Toast Me Boats. Oh, the outrigger's pulling it to the side. Oh, in, in this way. Yes. It goes really fast. Our gravity powered water boat worked great. The water ran down from high up, giving it more speed due to gravity, but no more mass than before. And our outrigger kept the whole thing from tipping over. Totes McBoats was a success. Thank you very much, Science Max Experiments at Large. Gravity powered boat, otherwise known as Totes McBoats! Totes, come back!